Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of From the Lighthouse. I'm here with my co-host Michelle. Hi Michelle. Hi Stephanie. Uh, It's just the two of us today. We're going to discuss the Man Booker shortlist. We discussed the long list a few weeks ago but we do have the shortlist now and the the winner is actually going to be announced on Monday the 17th of October. So we thought we'd get in now and have a chance to discuss the books that were um, that proceeded to the shortlist as well as predict our winner and see how horrendously we've got it wrong. Um, So I suppose my first question for you, Michelle, is what did you think of the shortlist? Look, by and large, I was really, I mean, it was a difficult, it was, it's a difficult job Mm. and there's no getting away from that. Uh, and, and for the most part, I'm, I'm really quite thrilled with the, the books that have ended up on that short list. I think my only regrets, I'd love to have seen Reservoir 13 yeah. and also Solar Bones. That's exactly my regrets. I would have swapped out um, History of Wolves um, for either of those books or possibly Paul Oster, although I haven't read it, as we'll talk about in a minute. Mm. Um, I really wanted to see Reservoir 13 and Solar Bones there because I yeah. thought not only were they wonderful reads, but they were so... Um, they're pushing at what the novel can do, I think, in interesting ways. Um, so, yeah, that was my kind of primary concern. But, I mean, most of these books, as we'll talk about, are really wonderful choices. I think that it's a year where we're kind of spoiled for choice rather than the opposite. Ah, oh, look, and, and I think the thing that was really striking about this list was the degree, the number of books that were really able to think about social realities in an imaginative way Mm. and isn't that just so um, indicative of the time that we live in that there's something so fraught about our times that uh, it it is actually uh, shaping in in, in such an overt way the the literature that we're reading. Well that's an interesting question. Does does, does terrible times for the world produce better literature? (laughs) Yeah or whether or not it just uh, sort of presents a sort of an urgency around yeah. the books that may not be there in 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 times that that seem more um, more more stable mm. or or you know sort of even if it's only an illusion of stability uh, and or more complacent maybe yeah yeah and and yet I think each of these books while taking well not all of well, yeah pretty much um, all of them in 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 one way or the other are, are really sort of taking uh, taking in their teeth um, some some really quite hefty political ideas. Mm. I, I think the thing that the shortlist is doing is that it is doing it in, in a sort of a pressing and a, 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 an engaging and sort of most importantly imaginative mm. way. I thought it was a really quite a bold um, long list and short list in that it, it both deals with those social realities, as you said, but they're also quite um, formally different. Mm. I think with the, I'm thinking more here of Solar Bones and Reservoir 13, which unfortunately didn't didn't make it through. But I thought, um, or and even definitely something like Lincoln and the Bardo, yeah. they're, they're books that are experimental. They're books that aren't experimental in a kind of I'm being experimental way, but they're just pushing at the capacity and the capabilities of the novel. To, to do something that you don't see all the time. Yeah, I actually was thinking about that too. And, and one of the things that struck me was the way that perhaps, uh, you know, sort of the experimental in fiction um, and that sort of self-consciousness and, and mm. um, that, that comes with, with, with a, a post-modernist aesthetic has perhaps filtered through to the mainstream yeah and and I think you know we see it in the television that we watch I think Mm. we see it in the music that we listen to and it's as though the the sort of the fractured way of representing the world is more and more becoming the established way of representing yeah it's it's come down from that kind of highbrow literature space to the more kind of um popular literature space I think yeah, and, and I mean those 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 sort of um, fractured narratives are, are very much the, the the medium of texts, of tweets, of um, emails, of, of all yeah. of those things, and so it's almost as though uh, you know sort of the the the, the, the technological consciousness 
um, is is sort of behind that embracing of 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 something which, in actual fact, I think literature was doing way oh, yeah, before abs- technology. Absolutely, um, yeah. Which I think is a stunning, you know, just a stunning argument. Well, for... my favourite postmodern novel is the um, Life and Adventures of Tristram Shandy, written in the mid eighteenth century. Oh, absolutely. So, Stella, you know, first you know... book I studied in, in 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 English lit. Yeah. So postmodernism, nineteen seventies. No, no, no. Seventeen sixties. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but also, I think it, it's it's really sort of indicative of of a sort of a. Uh, a, 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 a particular consciousness and a, and a, and a, and a particular awareness of, of and, and I think it's a difficult one to work with because generally speaking, uh, you, you know, sort of that idea of rallying sort of people behind mm. cohesive ideas and cohesive narratives has been a really effective way of managing, <laughs> you mm. know, and controlling and promoting social order. Mm. Um, and and I'm, I'm interested in thinking through what this means when uh, it, it, it is becoming uh, conventional to think through existence as inherently fractured, as inherently mm. multiple, which is something that I think Paul Oster does. Yeah, well, that um, might be a nice segue into thinking about the the specific books that are on um, the, the shortlist. So I, since I failed completely, um, I have not read 4321 by Paul Oster. In my defence, it is... You could take out a person with a blow to the head with that book. It's so big. It looks like a, a house brick. Look, but I, I think um, also we, we need to talk about us, us as a team. So I don't Yes, feel you took one for I, the team. I, I took on Paul Oster and uh, you've read Elmet. I did read Elmet. History yeah. of Wolves, which I'm yet to do. So, okay, so, we, so we, are a team. we are a combined consciousness and yeah. together we have read Together them. we have read the shortlist, um, just not perhaps individually. <laughs> so did you want to start with, with Paul Oster? Yeah, look, I, I did because it, it, one of the reasons I was late to reading Paul Oster was because I, I did feel a reluctance about picking it up. Because it's so fat? <laughs> no, look, <laughs> no. Um, it, perhaps because I'd done some Paul Oster reading in my, in my, in my 20s and I, I guess perhaps there was just part of me that hadn't felt that visceral connection with Oster's writing that made me think, yeah, hell, I want to, I want to mm. live in in his words for you know one thousand something pages, mm. um, and so I, I I carry that with me into this into this uh, into this novel because um, you know we, we we do live in time, Paul. Uh, it, it periods and I, there's a I, lot of books out there to read. There's a lot of books out there to read, and I think also, and I think this is one of the things that needs to be made sort of explicit in some of the criticisms that Oster has 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 experienced. I mean, we were talking about the Guardian mm. podcast where um, it was it was really quite brutal brutally handled in the sense that he wrote some books back when he could write. Yeah, that's what was said um, of him, yeah. And I, I listened to that, and in actual fact it was really good grist for me going back in because I, I like to give things a fair chance. And when I read it, I thought there's an immense um, endeavour in this book and I think that he is employing you know, the skills of a writer at the peak of his career to, 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 to bring us a, a really complex exploration of um, of what it of, of what it means to, in, in in some sense t- to live um, you know because he's, he's sort of focused in on that on that buildings Roman and he's given us uh, a lot of people have talked about you know sort of four slim novels sort of crammed in so together. it's one man's life told four different ways well y- yeah it, it is well not not known I, I think that would be too simplistic a <laughs> yeah, rendering okay. of it yeah. because in actual fact it, it's it's much more that sense of a, a single um, uh, and I don't want to use the word subject because I think that sort of academic subject subjectivity language gets brought and um, but it, in some sense it's perhaps the that idea of exploring the subject of a subject and the way that uh, you know we the, the way that I guess nominative determination, you know, the way that our names shape us, because it is a story of a, um, a descendant of a of a European Jewish migrant to America, right. um, and the way that uh, you know, sort of the the, the the Ferguson is actually a mistaken a mistake on the part of the, the 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 customs officer, and of course we've got all this lovely irony unfolding with Ferguson being both uh, sort 
of Scottish, a Scottish name, but also in, in the Yiddish uh, forgetting. Right, okay, so he's so, given that name. So he's given yeah. this name, which then is, is carried on. And, and so we get this sense of all the different ways that, in, uh, that, uh, that uh, and, and I guess in some sense, it's a, the, what I liked about it was that it was a counter to this idea of the individual as forging their own way through mm. the world, which is such a, you know, such a story of our time. And it's so, that idea of the individual is, is so enmeshed in capitalism and, yeah. you know, all of the most, you know, abhorrent features of our time that it was nice to see uh, somebody thinking through the ways in which it's, it's sort of the conditions, it's, it's, it's the, um, the opportunities, it, it, it's the chance that mm. also feeds into... Yeah who any one individual is. And I, I think that's what Oster did. And, I mean, I, I can see where there might be some um, criticisms because, uh, you know, I think firstly there are some moments where it's a, it's a little bit hard in the way that he transitions from, you know, sort of the, 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 the sort of the focalisation, the characterisation to, to history, American history, um, you know, Rockefeller. Um, you, there's, there's lots of... Um, there's lot there's lots of uh, of American history in uh, sort of interwoven in the story, and I think that sometimes those those transitions are they they, they feel a little contrived, they feel a little clunky, and um, y- you know I think the other thing to be really sort of overt about is that it it is in a time where we're so beset by um, the, the, the 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 sort of the domination of of a white American male that I can't help but feel that that is also part of the, 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 the sort of the, the, the back step away from this story. Um, As in you're tired of the white American male being the centre or? Look, I, I think that yeah. we're, I think that there is this sort of, and this is where I think the talk, thinking through the context of the world that we're living in. Mm. And if we're going to say that we, we, we're sort of, we're not 100% convinced by Paul Oster, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's important to think through what mm. some of those reasons might be. Yeah. And, you know, you've got to ask yourself if in a different time where things were less fraught, where there's less sense of social injustice and, and, and all of the, the sort of things that are combining to make us feel like we want different stories from different people, mm. if that isn't actually part of some of the criticisms that Paul Oster has received. Yeah, I think that's an entirely fair point. Um, like I said, I can't really comment on the book since I haven't read a page, but I'm certainly kind of, yeah, tired of the, the, the centering of the, the kind of white male experience. Um, I think it's well past time to have some more diverse stories, more diverse authors, um, more diverse subjects. Um, I just kind of, I feel like I've read the white male buildings where I'm on so many times and I'm ready to read something else. Yeah, and it, it is a possibility that, that there mm. will be times in the future when, you know, we might see this mag- magnificent transformation mm. where, you know, sort of his story can be read as a part of a wider mm. um, sort of um, literary um, establishment and that may be the case because I think there's a lot to be, you know, I think there's a lot to be admired mm. in, in the one, two, three, four, uh, into the four, four three, three, two, two one. one. <laughs> um, and I certainly wouldn't just... Uh, condemn it outright no and I think it is saying important things and and I think it does have a, a, a sort of a, a, a profound engagement w- but it's it, and, and as I say I think that a lot of it does come down to um you know which 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 has to be explicit when we talk about a book mm. you know I think I think it, it, it has to be stated it's not a flaw in a, and of itself it's 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 a problem of context yeah, well, I think that's fair, and I promise that if it wins, I will read it. <laughs> How about pass that? Pass it on. <laughs> okay, tell Paul Oster that if he asks. Um, all right, so our next um, shortlisted book is History of Wolves, which I have read, but you have not. Um, I talked about this in a long list episode, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, my thoughts from the long list show were that it, there was some nice writing. Um, it was quite enjoyable, but I felt it was flawed and that plot-wise it was a bit of a mess. Um, I think there's some interesting ideas about um, children and parents and what kind of decisions parents can make about how they bring up their children and how um, what decisions they make in relation to their children when they're in their care. But 
Um, I found the whole that interesting question um, wasn't really well served by the plot. I thought it kind of fell apart in execution. Um, interesting ideas, nice writing. I'd like to see what Emily Fridlund does in the future because I think, you know, it's not like she's a terrible writer. It's it's fine. Um, but I wouldn't have put it on the, on the short list, I don't think. And I... Um, think that there are some real flaws with with it that prevented me from kind of wholeheartedly embracing it um it's very atmospheric though it's got some interesting characters plot wise I thought it sort of fell apart for me um I noticed that um according to Sarah Hall who is a man booker judge she has said that it's technically accomplished and evocative I would agree with evocative I wouldn't agree with technically accomplished I'm I'm really eager to read this because I think that it, it is I, I think a Man Booker Prize, I, I think great literature can actually sustain flaws because I, I, I think, you, you know, sort of that, that very endeavour of, 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 mm. um, of a flawless or, or, or pure book is, is completely and utterly mm. um, anathema to, 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 to literature and all of those sorts of things. But I do still think that, that if, if there are significant mm. flaws, then that, that's... I agree, a, 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 a criteria for, for removing something from a, a, a short list. <laughs> well, I was noodling personal. around the internet and my, my reaction to it, which was interesting ideas, nice writing, but a bit of a mess in terms of plot and, and execution, seems to be the, the kind of dominant view. So it is one that has had a bit of a mixed review. Um, so I am surprised to see it on the, on the short list, but... On the other hand, um, it's bringing attention to a writer who I probably otherwise wouldn't have read, um, and I think that she's capable of, of um, you know, excellent novels in the future, perhaps when um, it's not her debut novel. Um, so I'm not angry about it being there. I just sort of think it's a bit of an odd choice when compared to some of the others in the shortlist. Yeah, but, I mean, I think that also comes into that, uh, you know, sort of the... the, the the, the judges and the particular mix of judges yeah, that's right. and, and the sorts of um, you know the sorts of compromises or horse trading as as, yeah. I, as I think um, one of the judges put it that must go on yeah, that's in order right. to reach a short list although they were very adamant that uh, these were not everybody's third and fourth choice uh, in in term because mm. I, I think that there are times when you definitely feel as though judges have been polar polarized mm. and then need to find, you know, sort of a compromise by going down their favourite list. <laughs> um, and you do wonder whether or not there aren't perhaps a couple of trade-offs yeah. on that list. Yeah, that's um, right. I have to have this one. I'll let you have that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder. I mean, because this, this is all quite subjective. I mean, even though we like to think that there is a kind of objective, you know, standard of great literature out there, and perhaps sometimes there is in those books that sort of seem to really rise above everybody and, and uh, are universally kind of loved or praised, um, there is, you know, variables between people and what sorts of books they like and what sorts of books they don't. And um, perhaps this is just one where I just don't. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, but but I do trust your. I I, I absolutely trust. You'll your, probably your read it and love it. <laughs> well, if we do, we'll have a new. A yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll have a podcast. We'll have a podcast we'll on the history of wars. On the history of wars. Um, so our next shortlisted book is Exit West by Mosin Hamid, and both of us have read this. Yep. And again, we both of us talked about it in the long list show, and both of us loved it. Yeah. Look, I mean, this is uh, without um, sort of giving too much away, but this is definitely one of the books I'd be really happy to mm. see win. Um, and, and particularly hearing um, Moshin Hamid talk about mm. uh, the, his own work and, and his sort of logic behind what he did, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and So that was on the Man Booker podcast, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Was yeah. it The Guardian? I'm, I, one of those, blur- yeah. They're blurring into yeah. one at the moment. But it was, it was just, I think that, that that logic behind the fact that the refugee narrative tends to dominate or fixate on the, the, the transit Mm. Which is the probably you know sort of the 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 least shared experience, yeah. Um, that especially among readers because readers, you know, they they do tend to come from sort of privileged backgrounds, and and so you know his 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 sort of logic that um, by making the the, the 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 transit the the sort of the the, the shortest part of the book 
in order to focus. Instantaneous. Well, well, well yeah. the, the instantaneousness yeah. of the doors, mm. um, but also uh, I think there's the, the period when they're sort of, there's a, there's a few pages when they're, they're sort of in transit on the island. And, yeah, but, in the but, camp. But, and, yeah, yeah but, the, but, the, but the bulk of the book is actually set either in their, the characters past what their lives were like before the need to leave and then what their lives needed to be like once they arrived. Mm. And and I think that that was you know that that shows the sort of um, you know that that shows the sort of perception into our times you know that sort of searing um, that that sort of searing gaze into uh, in, into in, into the world that we live in and sort of discovers and uncovers and puts emphasis on. Uh, the shared experiences and, yeah. and the fact that uh, you know, in in actual fact, you can't sort of really understand the the transition without understanding what was lost in leaving. Yeah, and the thing that struck me reading that book, even though it is about you know the refugee experience and it has this kind of magical realist component with the doors that open up between different countries that allow you to to travel from one country to the next in a, in an instant. What struck me is how the focus for me was on that central relationship of the two main characters and how it developed almost kind of by accident and how it fell apart in this kind of very relatable, very understandable, very human way. So he's using these big ideas and these big themes, um, this social reality that we're living with, but what it all boils down to is a relationship. It boils down to the, the, the relationship and it also boils down to this sort of brilliant ability to to decenter all of the myths that we are told that are central to us as human beings. Absolutely. Which is that, you know, sort of, I guess, the marriage myth. Yes. You know, sort of that, that need that uh, to start again, it must be in twos. Yes. <laughs> you know, because in actual fact, that's not what happens. Yeah, that's right. And, and yet in no way is it, is it, a, is it a sort of... A, uh, because while it's, it it may not be a um, you know sort of the the happy ending in the term of terms of the marriage plot, mm. in, in actual fact uh, we we do get these characters meeting back years later, mm. um, and and being able to sort of laugh about their time and joke yeah. about yeah that was sex that we were having all that time you yeah, know, sort yeah. of and <laughs> um, but 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 I th- I think the thing is that it it, it shows this much more sort of complex view in, yeah. into what it is to, to, to be human and what it is mm. to negotiate uh, our lives, which often does require stepping out mm. um, alone. It often does require leaving things behind. And there's a lovely parallel between the sort of the the forced leaving behind of yeah. one's homeland yeah, exactly. Versus the sort of the, the coming to a, a realization that it was time to leave behind a certain relationship. Yeah, and it's a beautiful complexity. And that beautiful parallel between the way your life, you think your life is going to unfold, and the way your life actually unfolds, which is quite different because they have, or well, certainly um, the the male protagonist whose name completely escapes me right at this moment, um, he has a kind of idea of what his life is going to be in his home country but his experience of being a refugee disrupts that but even more significantly his experience of his of the relationship that he forms disrupts that and they branch off into two completely different unexpected kind of lives which I thought was was beautifully handled and it's such it's so simply written it doesn't try and be it's um, not emphasis on style or no. attention or anything. No, of those no, no, things. no. It's just beautifully sim- simply written. You kind of fall into the language. It's not um it's not trying to do anything too flashy, but it at it just seems to speak to you more deeply for that. Yeah, and and I and I think it was interesting to hear I I, I think it was the judge Philip um Tom Tom Phillips, I think, was who sort of said it was not an optimistic book, mm. um, and and of course, no book should really be entirely one thing or the no. other because that sort of defeats the purpose of, of 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 literature, which is always in 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 the the sort of the, the nuance and and the sort, yeah. of the sort of the multiple threads. But you know, in, in actual fact, um, despite the the sort of the the devastating social realities and and that tearing apart of of you know, sort of, of of London, of the cities around the world, and um, y- all of those really uh, quite 
perceptive and 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 really not far from the from the lived reality mm. of of the of the of the cities and 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 the, and the nations that we're living in uh I I, st- I felt that it was also not a, a, a pessimistic book. No, because in the in in that lovely pragmatic um, sort of continuing to live yeah. fashion of, of of the of the two protagonists with their um, you know sort of their self deprecating humor and irony at the, at the end I I didn't feel that it was it was it was pessimistic either no it was it was that um I mean they're refugees not migrants and that that distinction is important but I think they kind of have a, a an almost migrant experience of they get on with it you know and they make new lives for themselves that look different to the lives that they had perhaps imagined or um even hoped for but they get on with it they make new lives for themselves um, those lives have their own beauty. Those lives have their own pain, and it, it's it's a book that, as you say, isn't pessimistic, but nor is it optimistic. It's just it just is, and I like that it sort of sits in that spot without trying to answer a question. You know what I mean? It doesn't try to take a position. It just gives you what it gives you. Yeah, and it is. It's it's that negoti- It's the negotiations, and it's the need for constant. Mm. Um, for, 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 for constant reevaluation, mm. um, because in actual fact, you know, sort of neither, sort of neither neither traditions, nor um, you know, sort of the, the the prevailing myths of of our time are ever actually going to endure or be a, yeah. an answer in themselves. It's it's no. always going to be up to the individual to be able to adapt. Exactly. Um, so that's a that's a strong recommendation for Exit West from both of us. Absolutely. Um, we might move on to Elmet by Fiona Mosley, another debut novel, which I have read but you have not. Um, I just read this on the weekend, so I'm very fresh from reading it. Um, I really enjoyed this. Um, it's It's got a certain sort of similarity to the history of wolves um, in that there's a lot of description of the natural environment. Um, I think it's better than History of Wolves. It's about a um, a father and his two children who um, live very much in the wilderness um, and who have a very sort of hard scrabble existence. Um, it's very much about the kind of ways in which the afterlife of the kind of feudal medieval um, way of living follows through in this place, which is very um, which is in the north of England. Um, into this town because there are these um, tensions playing out in the town between a man who owns a lot of land versus the labourers who don't and who have to work on the land. Um, it's a violent book. Um, it's a certainly bleak in parts, but it's also very um, touching in its own way. So the main character, who is this father, um is a very violent, huge man who bare-knuckle wrestles and all of this sort of stuff. But he's also incredibly tender towards his children. So it's it's a book that kind of doesn't let people be one thing or the other. It's focalised by um, this man's young son, who's about 14. Um, I thought at first that it was going to be quite predictable in the way that it transpired, but it wasn't predictable in the way that I had... Um, anticipated and I ended up really enjoying it I thought it was real written I thought it was interesting I thought it was um, clever I liked the the use of the flashbacks because we do get the novel is sort of told in flashback Um, you you get a a sense of where the character is now and where the character has and how he's got to that point Um, so I, I ended up really really enjoying it it's perhaps not my absolute favorite on the on the short list but I thought it was well worth it. It's very much a kind of rural noir oh, novel. I'm really, I'm really hoping that you might lend it. Yeah, to I, me. of course. Um, I, I heard sort of parallels with Wuthering Heights. Yeah, it's, it, of, it is um, kind of yeah. Um, it's a little bit different to that um, in that there's not so much of a. I mean, there's no kind of romantic story at the centre. It's really the story of a father, his his daughter, and and his son. But yeah, I thought it was really well handled. The the daughter's story becomes really compelling um i really enjoyed it she the author is um currently apparently completing a phd in medieval history and you get that sense of the the kind of afterlife of the medieval in this town that they're still essentially 
a kind of quasi-feudal system in this town that is leading to problems and conflict. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. You could see how her reading in medieval history kind of fed into this story, even though it is set in contemporary England. Um, so I, I was really pleasantly surprised by this. Um, I would certainly recommend it. I really enjoyed reading it. It's an easy read. You can whip through it in a day. Um, and I really ended up being quite excited by it, I think. Well, that's thrilling because I, I mm. think, you know, authors who have the ability to sort of use their, um, you know, sort of, I guess, their, their, their scholarship in a way to provide a lens. Yeah. Mm. And it wasn't in a, in a kind of, you know, here's my thoughts on medieval history that are kind of sitting at the back of this story mm. about contemporary England. There, I think there's one reference to Robin Hood and that's it. Um, but you can see that this, this village or this town, the way that it's kind of medieval... Um, reality, I suppose, has fed into the way it still operates. I might have to lend you Jim Crace. Have you read Jim no. Crace's Harvest? No, Harvest? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it, yeah, but I haven't read it. Yeah, because I, th I think that for me that was one of those books that has a very long afterlife and mm. I think I'd be interested to read the two yeah. in parallel. Um, well, I was really, yeah, quite pleasantly surprised. I'd certainly read anything that Fiona Mosley wrote now. So, well, that's really um, yeah. thrilling. And, and, I mean, in a sense, that is what the, the Man Booker is about, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. You know, it, I would it, never, I'd, I'd never even heard of this before it came to the long list. And now I think, oh, I will read, if you come out with something else, I will, I will gladly snap it up and read it. Yeah. So, yeah. there you go. She's got one new fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, moving quickly along, um, we've talked about this before, Lincoln in the Bardo by George Saunders, which we both read and we both loved. Yeah. Look, I I loved it. I, I loved its audacity. I loved its ability to be both completely and utterly um, non-linear, fragmented, and yet completely and utterly retain its soul. Oh, absolutely. Which, for me, I mean, there were moments of such exquisite beauty and, mm. and, and such sorrow and, um, you know, such a sustained, without ever being sentimental, contemplation of, of, of mortality. Um, and as as well, I, I mean, just a brilliant demonstration of just how <laughs> completely and utterly problematic history as as a as a sort of a, a as a, as a single unilinear sort of narrative is yeah I mean, that's right you know, for anybody who didn't sort of understand that concept of of you know sort of history reflecting the voice of you know sort the of teller, a dominant yeah. or the whatever uh this is the book absolutely this is, this is the book this um, is the book i was thinking about this book this morning on the way to work and a kind of this book has everything in it is the mm. best way i can think of to describe it it's funny yep. very funny it's incredibly sad. Yeah. It's incredibly poignant. I think it would be very hard for um, a parent to read. I'm not a parent, I but am you are. Yep, and yep. I think it I would be very stuck. difficult yep. there were a to few read. Tears shed in the yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's got it's got um, a kind of intellectual engagement with the idea of history, yep. with the idea of story. Yep. It's got um, you know interesting discussions of race, of gender. Um, it just seems to have everything in it, and yet. It just works. Yep. It's playful. It's you know, playful it, it's, and it's, it's a playful. delight to read. Um, and I, I was interested because the um, I, the listening to the judge, uh, Tom Phillips, who, who said that he did not enjoy the first read. Mm. Um, and, you know, in, in a sense, because it is so polyvocal and yeah. it is so fragmented and, um, you know, I, I guess it's much easier for anyone who's got any sort of familiarity with op sites and, 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 mm. and um, referencing to find that funny and ironic rather yeah. than annoying. Yeah. Uh, you get better at sort of skating over those. Yeah. <laughs> the more, the more that, the more that you uh, are involved with them. Um, but that upon the second reading, uh, you know, sort of more of the brilliance emerged for him. I think this is a book that's really going to pay off second and third and fourth readings. Yeah. Because there's so much in it and there are so many narrators and there's so many voices that you hear from that I think that this is the kind of book that you could read it once a year and find something completely different in it. It, it isn't possible for, uh, for the human brain to... No. ...actually hold on to all of those myriad voices and yeah. ideas. Yeah, yeah. 
in in one sitting. It's just it's beyond. Uh, what is it? Is it's it's like five to seven layers of in, levels of oh. intention the human brain can. I know, and yeah. and and there's many more in this book. And, and then, yeah, and you can see too what a, what an excellent and dedicated and skilled craftsman George Saunders is. I saw him speak at the um, Sydney Writers Festival this year, and he struck me as so careful yeah. and so thoughtful about what he's doing. He he's not the kind of writer who you know will say, "Oh, the muse took me and I just came out with this." He is very thoughtful he's very careful in what he does but at the same time there's not a kind of contrivance to it it no. just it just seems to be very it's it's beautifully crafted look i think it's the discipline of the short story yeah uh, and and for anyone who's thinking through you know sort of becoming a writer i, I think yeah. he is a fabulous example for why you know sort of truly mastering that short story is, is so essential because have you read his short story I, i've read some of his short stories yeah. but i i do i think he's a magnificent writer a virtuoso i think oh yeah i've read his um two of his short story collections i think he's got four and they're pretty much the best short stories i've read i think yeah um it almost every single one does something unexpected and great and you just read every single one and go wow and then you read the next one you go wow <laughs> you know so yeah read george saunders if you're trying to be a writer because you could I can't think of anyone who could do better reading. And I, and I think also just in recognition of the sheer work mm. that must have gone into yes. this. Because These aren't dashed off. No. <laughs> um, and the, 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 the sort of the selection and the combinations mm. and um, just even having the ability to sit in so many characters of so many different persuasions. Yeah. Um, most writers will... Uh, attempt that number of characters in their whole entire life. Yeah. <laughs> and George Saunders has kind of done it. Done in it one, in one book, yeah. Done it in one book. Um, and also just that gorgeous liminal space of the Bardo. Yeah. Um, what a fantastic setting. Yeah, what a great idea. Yeah. Beautifully yeah. executed. Yeah. I can't rave enough about this yeah. book, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we autumn. should we should talk about Autumn by Alice Smith. It seems appropriate that this is the last one because it's Autumn. It is. <laughs> Um, it, it is, and I think this is a book that I I love, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of I, I think I'm pausing a little bit because we've just been uh, you know sort of so Im- uh, immersed and in, in such a state of admiration mm. of, of George Saunders that in in some sense following that virtuosic performance mm. um, we have Ali Smith who is such an ex- elegant um, writer and who is such a um, so perspicacious Mm. you know her ability to uh, have produced autumn in the way that she did in Mm. an ability that allowed with you know sort of in a time frame that allowed her to engage with Brexit that allowed her to engage with the 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 shooting of the 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 killing of the MP in a way that allowed her to bring us uh, you know sort of an artist who who sort of almost lost to us and do it all in exquisite prose. Uh, gee, you, you know, oh, got she's, it. it's, it's, it's incredible. She's great. I loved um, Autumn. I thought, as you said, it's an it's an ambitious undertaking. Um, I think I said in, in our long list show that um, it's a post-Brexit novel that works for me and a lot of the post-9-11 novels didn't yep. um, because it seems as if the, the kind of um, thoughts and um, feelings that... Um, were provoked in her post-Brexit are woven so seamlessly into this story. It doesn't feel like, oh, here's my political commentary now, now let's get back to the story. It's all woven together beautifully. Um, She is doing some great things in the novel. I think she's one of the kind of most interesting writers working today. I really loved her her last novel, which had that kind of flip structure, so some of the... um, some of the copies, um, how to be both. How to be both. Um, yeah. yeah. So some of the copies of the novel had the first half first and the second half second, and then flipped in other copies. So she's doing sort of really kind of interesting things in figuring out what the novel does. She's brilliant stylist. Um, every part of this book worked for me. The relationship between the young girl and the old man, the story of the artist, um, the kind of social kind of exploration. Her mother who you thought was going to be one kind of character and turns out to be a completely different kind of character. Um, and it's it's just really enjoyable. It's not long, it's not ponderous, it's just this brilliant nugget. Yeah, look, and, and I think, you know, Ali Smith combines this 
incredible sort of irreverence that allows her to do what she needs to do. I get the feeling she'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. That, I get that feeling from her writing. Yeah. I don't know why. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but, you know, sort of this sort of a, a courage to being irreverent. Mm. And I think at the same time you see... Uh, the, the the reverence for the things that still matter to her. I mean, you you feel the the influence of poetry in her mm. her, her, her her prose. You feel the the influence of of the literature that she's loved, and and so there's this marvelous ability to both completely and utterly upturn things, and and yet still hold on to the things that sort of feel as though they matter the most. Yeah, that's right. Um, and she seems to me a very natural novelist. Like it, it just it kind of. Um, flows naturally and the prose kind of just comes out that way and, and it, there's it, a lack yeah. of pretension to yeah. her that I just find so refreshing yeah you know just I, I mean to, to even just go you know sort of so publicly with the fact that she's setting herself this task that she's you know sort of going to sit down and 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 be a working writer who is going to bring us books that we can read and more than one book, you know, mm-hmm. in, in in sort of a, a, a quite a remarkable time frame, it, you know, to me that 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 that's that's a writer who is putting aside ego, yeah. Um, and I, and I think that that's sort of essential to the writers who who really um, sort of who who really become uh, the, the the sort of writers of any time is is that ability to um, to just to, to, to engage with with the world with their readers with with the stories that they want to tell and 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 to deliver yeah um, and she always delivers I think I think we she's, don't want to jinx yeah. her but yeah she does she does I mean well winter's <laughs> about to come out now yep, so yep, yep, um, yep. yeah so I'll be I'll be very keen to read that I understand they're not connected in terms of the storyline no. but um, the four seasonal quartet books will be kind of thematically linked but you know, I, do you know what I think of with Ali Smith I, I, I think of Shakespeare you know yeah, I think she's of a working a, writer yeah. who, who you know I mean Shakespeare phenomenal output yeah you know and she just sort of churns out excellent books one after another yeah and, yeah. and it's, it's as though there's not this sort of um, preciousness about mm. it and and it, it's it's just it's 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 pleasurable. Yeah, um, and it feels like a gift to the to yeah. the reader. It, and you, know, I always enjoy picking up an Ali Smith. It's, she's one of those writers where I feel quite confident. You know, when sometimes you just think I want to read a novel that I'm not, I'm going to like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, you have to kind of be confident going in. I that's what Ali Smith is to me. I know I'm going to like it going in. Yeah. I always do. Yeah. So it's very reassuring. It is <laughs> as a reader. It is. It's. It's. And you don't want her to stop, and she doesn't no. seem to be. So yeah. That's, that's so it's excellent. like okay, yes. that suits me. <laughs> um. So those are our six shortlisted books. What is your pick for what you would like to see win? If you had to pick one of these, and you Do can't cheat and say two, oh you have to pick God, one. Heather, that is so. Tough. If you need a minute to choose. I, well, I came in prepared. I did, look. Yeah. I thought I was going to be able to say three. No, I'm a very strict <laughs> oh podcast goodness. host. Ooh, pick one. Pick, pick one. one, Michelle. Do you want to know mine? Yeah, you go first. Lincoln in the Bardo. Oh yeah, look. I just can't get past it. I just thought it was everything a book should be. I, I feel like I could read it once. That was my three. Once a, uh, can I say my three? Yeah, and pick yeah, one? yeah, yeah. Okay, fine, thank you, fine. thank you. I look, <laughs> Exit West, Lincoln and the Bardo and Autumn were my three. Those are my three favourites. Are they? Yeah. Oh, we're so mm. similar. Mm. Um, look, I'm going to just because it's important to not be too much of, 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 of mm-hmm. <laughs> a, a sort of a single head with these sorts of things, I'm going to say Autumn. Okay. Oh, Excellent. no, Exit West. Oh, yeah, all right, Exit West. Yeah, there we go. Oh, you can see <laughs> the workings of my mind. I know. It's yep. a, Well, look, I mean, it's, a, it's like a good Lincoln problem to have. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. Yep, yep. So what book do you think will win? Look, Which is a separate question. No, no, I was, I was interested by the fact that um, I, I, I keep coming back to that little sort of um, the comment that um, Tom... Phillips. Tom Phillips, one of the made, judges, yeah. About uh, Lincoln and the Birdie, didn't enjoy it the first time round, <laughs> and you know, it, it, it just felt that um, that was that was that was a, a, a sort of a fairly um, revealing uh, remark. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was either Exit West. Um, or possibly Elmet. I think it's going to be Elmet would be a really interesting dark horse win. Mm. Um, 
I think it's going to be Exit West. I think it's the book. And I'm very happy with that, even though yeah. Lincoln and the Bardo is, is my favourite. Um, I think it's a book that speaks to our particular moment in time. Um, I think it would be seen as, I mean, looking at considerations outside the novel itself, um, it would be a kind of very um, appropriate choice, I think, for the world in which we live. Um, I suspect that Lincoln and the Bardo chances might be diminished by the fact that an American won last year and I, I don't think, think it's level of difficulty in, in, in because with yeah. that, keeping in mind of you know sort of that popularity sort of aspect and 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 you know sort of the the, yeah. the boost I, I wonder if if the you know sort of it, it's 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 a it's a it, it is a dense read, you know, with all mm. of the, the sort of the, the different voices in it. On the other hand, it's been very successful as a seller. Mm. So I wonder, too, whether that might, you know, it's already had a lot of popularity, so maybe they'll kind of think that that might be something to think about. But, yeah, I just think that they'll be reluctant to give it to Americans two years in a row because there was a lot of kind of commotion about letting Americans in because people felt that once you let the Americans in, then that's it, it's going to be the American prize. And so I think that that might factor into the judges' Um, discussions that they won't want to to be seen as you know now Americans are going to dominate this prize that was traditionally a kind of British or in its Commonwealth kind of prize. So I think those considerations might come into it. Um, I, look, I would be happy with I'd be happy with Lincoln in the Bardo, Autumn, um, Exit West, or even the Dark Horse Elmet. Um, I probably wouldn't be jumping up and down if it was four three two one only because I have to read it. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't be happy with History of Wolves, but yeah. look, I'm going to be happy in, with most of the winners so <laughs> yeah well now yeah. all that remains is uh the big day yeah so monday the 17th of october um will be the um unveiling of the winner i am i understand that they actually put it on tv in britain oh, the wow. award yeah, ceremony I watch that somewhere on, oh it's probably going to be at like midnight it's or... probably going to be at like midnight our time but um yeah hopefully you we um appreciate the winner and maybe you will see with which one of us is the closest? So, <laughs> my pick was Exit West. Your pick was also and I was Exit a West. Real Wilson and went for the three. And um, yeah, so yeah. no, I think um, we will perhaps even manage to meet again. We we may. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, hopefully, you have got some recommendations for future reading from these Man Booker series of episodes. Um, we'll be back in a week. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and once again, I will remind you to please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people to find um, our episodes in our series. If you have any suggestions, you can send them through to us, either through Apple Podcasts or through our website from thelighthouse.org. If you've got any suggestions for future episodes or if you violently disagree with any of our opinions, um, we'd be happy to hear from you. So we'll see you again in a week. Goodbye. <laughs>